everybody. And now Facebook Live is with us. So for those of you that are at home, thank you very much for showing up. Uh, we find ourselves tonight in Romans chapter 7, 7 to 13. Uh, the title is Sin and the Law. Uh, so let me read verses 7 through 13 for you. What should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. The sin and sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Therefore, did what is good cause my death? Absolutely not. On the contrary, sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for another beautiful day. We thank you for the refreshing rains and even the hail for those of us that got that. Uh, Lord, we thank you now for an opportunity to look at your word. We'd ask that your spirit would enlighten our word, give us grace to understand and uh, see how it applies in our day to day. But also, Lord, that uh, we would not deny what the Word says, uh, knowing that uh, you speak truth to us, and that truth sets us free. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so sin and the law. First of all, the purpose of the law, it reveals sin. Uh, notice verse 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. So looking at our uh, outline, uh, he again asks another question because he is foreseeing that the argument that he's presenting, someone's going to say, well, then the law is the problem. And, and no, the law is not the problem. Notice the question, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Or if you will, is the law the problem? Now, there are people today that are what they call antinomianisms, that kind of thing. Uh, but basically, they're anti-law. And uh, Jesus said that not one jot or tittle will be undone. He is going to fulfill the whole thing. Now, are we under the law today? And of course, we've already kind of answered that. In Jesus fulfilling it, we're not under the law anymore, but we'll find out in the next chapter that as we walk in the Spirit, we will fulfill the law. Uh, now, mind you, what does that mean? The law is summarized into two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So as we walk in the Spirit, those two things will be done. Those two things being the summary of the law if you were to go back and look at the Ten Commandments and you're walking in the Spirit, ultimately you're going to be doing those things. So notice uh, once again, Paul says, certainly not, or in my version, absolutely not. Again, this is the strongest Greek negative, me genoitu. It is used in chapter 3, verse 4, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 31, chapter 6, verse 2, chapter 6, verse 15, and then again in chapter 7, verse 13. Uh, notice the truth found in the opposite. He says, on the contrary, uh, the imperfect is revealed by the perfect. He says, I would not have known sin except through the law. Now, there is some discussion in this chapter <clears throat> excuse me, about who Paul is talking about. But I would like you to see what are the pronouns. Now, in today's day and age, everybody's picking their own pronouns. 
We're not talking about that. We're talking about Paul speaking about whom? He says, I. He's talking about himself. Now, personally, I think, because there is, again, some discussion, since we don't know who he's talking about, if you're not looking at the pronouns, um, they uh, wonder, uh, is this pre-salvation? Is the next part pre-salvation? And we'll talk about that next week. But the reality is, is I think that this is pre-salvation, and I'll explain why as we go through it. But notice what he says here. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Now notice, he has already revealed several times the purpose of the law was that you might know sin. Notice, even the Gentiles have the law written in their hearts in chapter 2 and verse 15. Let me read a couple of verses for you. Chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Chapter 4, verse 15. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. If there isn't a rule that says thou shalt not, how can you do something that you didn't know that you shouldn't do? So that's the idea there. And then chapter 5, verse 13. For until the law was in the world, but sin is not, uh, excuse me, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. And we've already discussed those passages. In chapter 2 and verse 15, who show the work of the law, this is speaking of the Gentiles who didn't have the law, but they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing uh, them. So with this in mind, if we were to go back and look at all those passages, what we see is whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, there is an understanding that there is rules, regulations, and of course uh, we saw where no one is righteous because they don't uh, live by them. So that brings us to letter C. Paul using I and me indicating he is giving personal testimony here. Okay, I don't see where that's really hard to understand. But again, when people start studying theology and Bible passages for some reason, simple things like this kind of go like this, okay? So as he's using I and me, I believe he is indicating personal testimony here. Number one, how the Holy Spirit used the law in his own life leading up to his Damascus Road experience and the three days afterwards. Uh, you can read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 18 to see that. Notice in his testimony to King Agrippa, he says that he was kicking against the goads. In Acts 26, 14, And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you per persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now that particular expression uh, served a purpose in the day, but basically Christ was saying, you've been being convicted and you haven't been listening, okay? So uh, that's the idea there. Um, notice as a Pharisee, Paul studied under Gamaliel. Uh, he had tried to follow the law meticulously. He actually considered himself zealous for God. In Acts 22.3, he says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. In Galatians 1, 13 and 14, he says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Or Philippians 3, 5 and 6 circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, that external trying to live by, 
blameless. If you were to look at my life, you would not see a problem is basically what he's saying here. So uh, he considered himself zealous for God and zealous Jews had modified the externalized and externalized the law. Everything for them was outward performance. They were not dealing with the inward. And therefore, I've never committed adultery. Aren't I something? Until Jesus comes along. I've never murdered anybody. Until Jesus comes along. Why? What did he say? You have heard it said of them who are of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you look at a woman in lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Or you've heard it said of them who are of old, thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, if you're angry without a a cause, you're in danger of the council. If you say to your brother, raka, basically empty head, blonde, you know, that kind of thing, um, you're in danger of the council. And if you say to your brother, you fool, you're in danger of the fires of hell. I don't know about you, but when we're angry, do we uh, limit our speech to raka, empty head, Airhead, fool, Uh, very often we go much further than that, don't we? So though I've never murdered anybody, external, I've never committed adultery, external. When you look at the internal, uh uh-oh, we all have problems. So Paul was looking at all of this from the external point of view. Number four, during his pre-salvation conviction, Paul started to understand that the demands of the law were internal and that he failed miserably, and that is what he has given testimony to here. Notice he goes on to say, for I would not have known. Again, Romans 3.20, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, covetousness. This word here is epithumia, a longing, especially for what is forbidden, concupiscence, dire, a desire, lust, or to lust after. Now, again, very often, this word is going to be translated in the context of desiring something that's wrong. It is used in desiring that something's right also. But uh, he says, I would not have known covetousness. Notice it says, Christians shouldn't live according to the lusts of their old self. Now, there is a bunch of verses there. And I was actually going to read them all off, but I'm going to challenge you to take some time there. Uh, And the reason is, is because we see that we, even after salvation, still have a problem with desires, with lusts, with covetousness, and it shows itself in a lot of different ways. But notice the next set of verses, unbelievers have no other choice. Uh, Just Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3 And I don't have that one. Uh, It says, And you he uh, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 1, who walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, and were by nature children of wrath, uh, like everyone else, um, who walked according to the lusts of their hearts or the lusts of their minds. So that's where we were before we were saved. So that shows you that unbelievers, they have no choice. They run after uh, their, their desires, their passions all the time. And then uh, notice he says, I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And we're all sitting there going, great, my neighbors don't have any oxes or donkeys or servants, not, and my house is bigger than his, right? You shall not covet your neighbor's Corvette, Camaro, table saw, drill, whatever. It, it doesn't matter what it is. If God has blessed them with that, hallelujah. If you want one, talk to God. (laughs) That's the idea there, okay? You shall not covet. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.21, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Ooh, that's a little bit further. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, um, so that's what the law says. And he goes, I wouldn't have known that I had the problem unless the law had said that. Huh? 
That's how you figured out you had a problem? He goes on. The work of the law, it arouses sin. Think about that with me for just a minute. You got 25 toys. You got a dozen kids. You tell them all. You can play with all the toys except for. Which one do they all want? The one you said don't play with. Because the law or a rule of some sort arouses sin in you. He goes on to say, but sin, that which is already in a person's heart, uh, taking opportunity by the commandment. Uh, the word opportunity here is a forme, uh, a starting point for an expedition. <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, an opportunity, occasion. Sin uses the commandment as a starting point. Okay? And uh, what is the starting point? Notice number three here. The natural rebellion of the unregenerate nature picks up from there. Uh, in Romans 8, verse 7, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So for an unbeliever, as soon as they know God said, Thou shalt not, the first thing they want to do. Okay, think with me for just a minute. Have you ever read the Old Testament where it starts telling you about the uh, oil that's used in the lantern? It's a special oil. And it gives you the recipe. And then it says, and if anyone makes it, they're going to be accursed. I don't know about you, but as a saved person, the first thing that went through my heart was, I wonder if we could make that today. You'd think it's silly, but that's what went through. It's kind of like, didn't you read the other part? You shall be cursed. Sin nature doesn't care. Okay. And so that, that's the idea there. Uh, notice, sin taking the opportunity produced in me all manner of evil desire. Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So again, the law and the rebellious sin nature working together, it really shows what's in the heart of the person. And then notice he goes on to say, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Okay, what do we mean? Well, Romans 4.15, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. If there's no rule to break, then you don't know you've broken a rule. Because there is no rule. That's the idea here. And so, uh, for apart from the law, sin was dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Uh, there it is. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So the law serves the purpose of letting a person know that they have sinned, <clears throat> which brings about uh, death. Notice, it's not that sin doesn't exist apart from the law. In Romans uh, 5, 12, and 13, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and that, thus death spread to all men, because all sin. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. Again, if there isn't a rule to break, how do you know that you did wrong one way or the other? Uh, this morning, we, I was over at Blues Creek, and a young believer that's just been coming to church for the last couple of months, he goes, do you believe in the hall of souls? And I'm going, what do you mean by that? Comes from a Catholic background. And basically within Catholic theology, as well as some other churches, uh, they believe that God created everything that was going to be created, including all of the people that would ever live. And those souls are stored in a storage tank up there in heaven someplace. And whenever there's a um, conception, one of those souls gets put into the body. Now, how did God create Adam and Eve's souls? They were innocent. They weren't necessarily righteous in the sense that you have to actually do something right to be righteous, but they weren't sinful because you actually have to do something wrong to be sinful, right? So they were kind of in that neutral state where they had to could pass the test or fail. And of course, we know they failed, right? Now, what about all the souls that are born after that? 
what they don't think about is if you're taking a already created soul and putting it in the body and now that person becomes a sinner, what's the real problem? The body is the problem. And that is a methodology of thinking or a theological concept that, no, it's not the body. Yes, sin dwells in this body. Even after we're saved, we deal with an unredeemed body. But it's not, the body is not the problem. It's sin that's a problem. So through the procreative process, God actually uh, brings about not only a body, but a soul that is twisted just like mom and dad are. God visits the iniquity, the sinful twist of the father to the children, to the children's children, to the third and fourth generation, and he does that through the procreative process as well as raising the kids and stuff like that. So uh, uh, though sin, uh, n- notice it, not that sin doesn't exist apart from the law. Uh, my little Ida May, uh, how, she's two months old. She's kind of chunking up, and she's beautiful, of course. Um, she's a little sinner. How about Baker? He's uh, seven, eight months old, and he's a little sinner. Now, both of them seem to be real happy children, and they don't seem to give too much problem, but uh, yesterday afternoon, we got back from Omaha, and uh, it was time for Baker to go take a nap. And uh, Sam said on her way back there, I know he's going to scream because he is not ready to take a nap. He's going to scream because he got this pure soul from some hall up in heaven. No, 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 no. He's going to scream because I don't want to take a nap right now. Ah! Okay, so that's the, the reality of the matter. Sin does exist. It's just where there isn't a rule, it isn't imputed as sin like that. So notice, letter B, it lies dormant or it's not fully active. That's what it means uh, when he says, apart from the law, sin was dead. It was, it was lying dormant. It wasn't fully active. When the law comes about, it arouses it. And it, it, it brings it to life. It makes it active. So let her see the result of the law. It ruins sinners, verses 9 through 11. So telling of his perspective before salvation. Again, I believe this was Paul's testimony. I was alive once without the law. Now, was he? We'll see as we go along. This is his perspective. I was doing fine. Notice, as a Pharisee, he was an expert in the law and believed that he was blameless in regard to it. I already read Philippians 3, 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Okay? Okay. So he thought he was doing fine. Notice number two, he had served through self-effort the oldness of the letter, uh, Romans 7, 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That's how he had served before, and this is where it brings him. He goes on to say, uh, letter B, But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now notice, I was alive without the law. When the law comes, the commandment comes, sin revives. It's aroused. And then I died. Now, question. Did he die? Or did he come to the knowledge that he was a sinner and therefore separated from God? That's what's really happening here. Uh, And he recognizes, I am spiritually dead. Notice, when a true understanding of the internal requirements of the law came, he began to see himself as having come short of the law's righteous standards. Sin revived. He came to realize his true condition. I died. He came to realize his true spiritual state. Ephesians 2, 1 And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But the things which were gained to me, all those things I did, uh, living by the law, being blameless, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss 
for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. As I'm looking at the life that I was living, though I thought I was doing great, I recognize none of it had any eternal value. I was dead in my sins. And at that point, of course, he was willing to give up trying to do it all in uh, the oldness of the letter, but to now to come to Christ. So that brings us to letter C. And the commandment, again, representing God's law, which was to bring life. Now, we've been talking about through the law is the knowledge of sin. But, but notice what it says in Leviticus 18.5. Uh, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 11. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Verse 13, yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. Verse 21, notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to observe my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. But they profane my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury upon them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Notice, in each one of these cases, he's basically saying, look, if you live by the law, you get all of the blessings that I've promised you. You get to stay in the land. You get to stay alive. But if you don't live by the law, then there's penalty. I'm going to cast you out of the land. Others will come and attack you and kill you and uh, haul you off as slaves and, and things like that. So that's the idea of um, if, he, if you, live by, if you uh, do the commandments, you will live by them. Is it, I had the understanding that, like James says, if you uh, are going to try and be justified by the law, you have to live by every single point of it. And what he's saying here is, if you do what the law says, you're going to have a long life. But it's not eternal life, it's just long life. And if you don't, then of course the enemies will come and get you. That kind of a thing. <laughs> uh, so that brings us to uh, notice which is to bring life. If you broke the law, you would suffer the consequences. If you followed the law, you would live in the blessings of God. So, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. So he realized his complete inability to truly do according to the law, again, concerning his internal intentions. And therefore, he understood that he stood under the sentence of death because the wages of sin is death. So he's coming to the point where he recognizes, I need Christ. Notice, uh, as believers, we are given eternal life because the requirements of the law are fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans uh, verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 4. But, he goes on to say in verse 10, the body is dead because of sin. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. So even after we're saved, because sin still affects the body, it is incapable of doing that which pleases God. But because we have the Spirit, we have life. So for sin, he goes on to say, taking occasion by the commandment, it deceived me. James 1.14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away, when he is seduced, when he is deceived by his own desires, he's enticed, he's seduced, he's deceived. He believes the lie. That's when he is tempted. Okay? Uh, notice deceit is sin's most subtle and disastrous evils. People are deceived in thinking they are acceptable to God because of their good work and they see no need for salvation. So many false religions include self-effort, trust, 
and righteousness. If you talk to the average Catholic, do they believe in Jesus? Sure they do. Do they understand that he is God? Sure they do. Do they understand that uh, he died to pay for sin? Sure enough. Though they leave him hanging on the cross, if you ask the average Catholic what happened to him after he died, they're going to tell you that he rose again. How are they getting to heaven, hopefully? By their good works. If they don't do enough of them, they get to go and pay for their sin. But I thought Jesus already did that. He paid for Adam's sin. He didn't pay for their personal sin. So they do good works to overcome their personal sin. They go to purgatory to overcome their personal sin. And when they've overcome their personal sin, then they hopefully get to go to heaven. Yes. No. They only know that they didn't make it when they die. But notice, if we go back here, we have self-effort, good works, trust, and righteousness, the righteousness being what they would label as good works. They never deal with sin as a problem. Uh, so <clears throat> sin, taking the occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it killed me in verses 9 and 10. Again, it's not as though all of a sudden uh, sin did something to it. He's coming to the realization that he is spiritually dead and cannot in any way uh, satisfy God's uh, requirements. So letter D, the byproduct of the law. It reflects the sinfulness of sin. Paul goes on, therefore, answering the question of verse 7, is the law sin? And of course the answer is no. Therefore the law is holy. Psalm 19, verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I don't know about you, but when I look at some of the prayers of the Old Testament, Moses, Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, why wouldn't he have? Moses is still a sinner after his trust in God, right? And he's not presumptuous. Hey, everything's kosher between me and God now. He knows, knows he still has his issues. So if I have found favor in your sight, if I have found favor in your sight, I, I don't know about you, but I like that. But notice the word of God is, uh, how does it say it here? Uh, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Imagine as you're reading through the word of God, the Holy Spirit is working with the word of God to open your eyes to the truth that your sin won't let you see. And so uh, the law is good. Uh, how about the next verse? Psalm 119, verse 137. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me. Kind of bring me back to life in your way. What kind of worthless things are we asking God to turn away our eyes from looking at? Well, in this context, it might be all the good things that I could do. They're actually worthless, aren't they? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah. You know, I, I, we're driving here and I got behind a Corvette. Corvettes are nice cars. I, I personally don't want one. Uh, they're a little bit too low to the ground. Their shock absorber system is not that good, right, Dave? Uh, so you feel every bump. They're meant to go fast. And of course, if you do that, the police have a problem with you. So, <laughs> But uh, here, here it says, Nana K. It's kind of like, okay. And I drive by her and it's kind of like, yeah, it was Nana, all right. I don't know what her name is. I assume maybe Kay has something to do with it, but it was grandma, okay? <laughs> um, uh, whole point being is the Corvette is a worthless thing. Uh, it'll get you from here to there, providing it's running okay, okay? But turn my eyes away from worthless things. We get caught up in all kinds of things in life. In this context, Paul, the worthless things for him was all the good things that he could have done. It was because the law pointed out that he had an internal problem that only God could take care of. So the law is holy, but the, and the commandment is holy and just and good. 1 Timothy 1.8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it 
lawfully. What do you mean by that? How many of you have eaten pork sometime in the last year? Okay. Uh, when I first got on Facebook, I was following one page that um, supposedly a Christian page, and I don't have a problem with that. I'll assume that they were. But there was a, a misunderstanding of the law. They felt as though they quoted a verse from, I believe it's Isaiah, when God comes back, will his people be eating pork? And so as Christians, they were saying, we shouldn't be eating pork. And I referred to Acts chapter 10 and Matthew and Mark, where Jesus declares all foods clean. And they twisted that around and said, it basically means you didn't have to wash your hands. No, he declared all foods clean because it didn't matter what went in your mouth. That didn't defile you. It's what came out of the heart through the mouth. That's what, But, uh, you know, the law is good if it's used lawfully. Even in the New Testament, it says some are going to say you shouldn't eat certain kinds of foods. You shouldn't get married. You shouldn't celebrate certain holidays when all of these things are just a shadow of what's real, Christ is the real, it says. And so uh, the law is good as long as it's used uh, uh, properly. Number two, he then, uh, he then has then what is good become death to me? Uh, did I die because of the law? Certainly not. The law was not the problem, but it did point out what was the real problem. Though I may have been able to externally follow the law to the letter, there was still a sin problem inside. The law wasn't the problem. The problem was sin, that it might appear sin, that it might show itself as being sinful, was producing death in me through what is good. Okay, so that's the idea here. The law is not the problem. It showed me where the problem really was. Notice he goes on to say, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So the ultimate purpose of the law is to drive men to faith in Christ. Galatians 3, 19 through 22. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed, singular, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture was confined has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. The promise being eternal life, which God promised from before the foundations of the world, those who would trust in what he has said and who he has sent, they might receive that promise. And the law was just to point them, look, you got a problem, that's the one you need to go to. That's the one you need to go to. That's the one you need to go to. So, oh, ah, sorry, that last point. I meant to bring in my uh, commentary and read Robert Murray McShane's Jehovah Sidkenu, The Lord Our Righteousness. Uh, back over here, I believe it is. Uh, the first one in the red, The Lord is My Righteousness. There was a, a great poem that uh, I meant to re read to you, but you'll have to borrow my commentary and look at it later. How's that sound? Because <laughs> I totally forgot to bring it in here. Okay, so is the law the problem? This is the testimony of Paul, how he came to Christ. Is the law the problem? No. The law points out the problem. He wouldn't have known that he had the problem if it wasn't for the law. The law says, thou shalt not covet. And all of a sudden he realizes, man, I'm coveting all over the place. Yes, I haven't gone down to the mall. I haven't spent all my money on those things that I covet, but I still want them. Ah, I have a problem. And in the law pointing out that there was a problem, now he recognizes my real state, spiritual state is, I'm dead. 
I need someone that is going to save me from where I am. And that points him to Jesus Christ, at which point he comes to faith. Now, unfortunately, if coming to faith solved all of the problem, he could have stopped right there. But the next passage that we'll deal with next week is going to deal with how sin is still a problem after salvation. And there's only one resolution to that problem, and it's the same resolution that got him saved. It's faith in Christ walking in the Spirit. Well, a little bit shorter of a lesson tonight, which makes up for all the long ones. How's that sound? So let's close in prayer and we'll let you go. Father, as we come this evening, we once again thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for opening our eyes to our sinfulness. And though we struggle with how bad we might really be, we recognize that we fall short. We thank you for Jesus Christ living that perfect life that none of us could live. We thank you for that he died to pay the wage of sin, not just the sin we were born in, but all of our sins. And as we have uh, turned to him, you have given us eternal life and we get to continue to confess our sins and uh, you are faithful to cleanse and to forgive. Father, thank you for all of that so that we might have a, a relationship with you. We ask that you might continue to guide and direct us, not only in our understanding, but in our day-to-day practice that we may be able to enjoy the fellowship that we have with you and with one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So Wednesday night is coming. It might be. Pastor is so resourceful. One who claims he had, oh, I got it right there. (laughs) Wow. Boy, talk about this guy who doesn't know what's going on this weekend. Let me read, once again, Robert Murray McShane's Jehovah Tzidkanu. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the tree, Jehovah Tzidkanu was nothing to me. I oft read with pleasure to soothe or engage Isaiah's wild measure and John's simple page. But even when they pictured the blood-sprinkled tree, Jehovah Tzidkanu seemed nothing to me. Like tears from the daughters of Zion that roll, I wept when the waters went over his soul. Yet uh, Yet thought not that my sins had nailed to the tree, Jehovah Tzidkanu, t'was nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fear shook me, I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could I see. Jehovah Tzidkanu, my Savior, must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fear banished with boldness I came to drink at the fountain. Life-giving and free, Jehovah Tzidkanu is all things to me. Jehovah Tzidkanu, my treasure and boast, Jehovah Tzidkanu, I ne'er can be lost. In thee shall I conquer by flood and by field, my cable, my anchor, my breastplate and shield. Even treading the valley, the shadow of death, this watchword shall rally my faltering breath. For while from life's fever, my God sets me free, Jehovah Sidkanu, my death song shall be. So that, I, I'm not really a big poet or anything like that, but I thought that was some good stuff to remind us that there was a purpose in God giving us the law and to bring us to Jesus so that we might be righteous. Well, getting back to Wednesday night. Wednesday night's coming. It's just three days away, right? And food arrives between eh, 5.45 and 6 o'clock. Are we going to eat? We're going to start serving 10 till 6. That's why your food needs to be here a little bit earlier than that. Uh, Some people like coming at 6. We won't be able to eat your food because we will have already been through the line. So come. (laughs) And uh, we have a... 
a new series this uh, summer, uh, Live Not By Lies. A good book if you need uh, to know. It's on Amazon for about $16, $17. And then there's a study guide for another $10. Uh, Having started to read it already, I can tell you it's a good read. And it'll definitely make you think, especially in this day and age. Because there may come a time, as we're trying to develop community within the church, There may come a time when, boy, we're really going to need to know how to handle life under what he calls soft totalitarianism, or maybe hard. So I hope to see you all come out on Wednesday night. In the meantime, have a good God-honoring week.